I think there's a level of intensity in Arkham Asylum that has been lacking from other video games. In Arkham Asylum, it's the real world, and he's fighting real thugs and real killers, and people really do get killed in the game. It's a very, very scary world, but it's a world that he's perfectly suited for. In Batman Arkham Asylum, we really wanted Batman to face the worst night of his life. And so by taking him to Arkham Asylum, the home of the supervillains and where they are all kept, we really could take Batman and challenge him in so many varied and different ways. You're in this kind of dark universe where you're not entirely sure of anyone's motives. From the very first cinematic, uh, when I saw the picture, it became really clear just how dark this was going to be. We wanted to create a game that was in a dark, gritty environment. You know, Arkham Asylum really lends itself to that location and the kind of mood that every Batman fan really wants to play a game in. When I started my career in the early 80s, there were a lot of Batman developments I'd see at various studios, and they were all brightly colored, kind of camp interpretations of Batman. And I would love to do Batman if we could make the cartoons like the old Fleischer Superman cartoons, because that should be his world. Art Deco, dark, with stirring music, a very cinematic take on it. Creating art, uh, yeah, in the Batman, Batman world was something very exciting for all of us. Well, this is a different kind of animation than, than anyone has seen before. It's a very unique look, and I think the audience is going to get very excited by it. It looks great. Something which is really big in the Batman world is the Gothic. So we try to really kind of push the Gothic elements, the kind of like Victorian era, a lot of like metal rock. Gotham is an East Coast city, and it was built a long time ago, so there are a lot of English and European influences in its design, and that was perfectly captured, and I think that's very appropriate, because Arkham is really bedlam, and it really does have the look of an old madhouse. Inside, you know, there are some very sleek areas, there are some very steampunk-looking areas, but Arkham is really an old mansion. Well, through the different buildings, we really try to recreate some kind of history, even, uh, through these buildings. So if you're going from like Gothic to more kind of like Victorian era, where it's going with a lot of metal rock, a lot kind of like creepy Frankenstein contraptions. We added a lot of kind of gritty, moody medical contraptions and slowly we just saw it come into life. The first thing we did is we just dived straight into the comic book history. You know, we bought everything we could get our hands on. We just piled up a massive stash of comics and just read through them all to really get a feel for this character. We read up a lot of reference about the Batman universe and we made sure that we st stuck to sort of things that are already in the universe, but we slightly changed them to bring our interpretation of it into life. I think Everyone's going to be happy with what we've done. There's not going to be people saying, no, it shouldn't be like this, it should be like that. They'll say, yeah, that works. I think it's also got kind of a dual audience. Um, and one way, we're using a lot of elements that maybe the comic book readers wouldn't get. But also, we've got a lot of kind of little features in there where big Batman fans would enjoy and be out of spot. But it's also for the people that aren't big Batman fans, and they can also sit back and just enjoy the story. The reason he resonates with audiences so much is because he's got no superpowers. Because he's just a man, he could literally be every man. OK, he has all the gadgets and the access to technology and perhaps things that your average man wouldn't have. But he is just a man. I don't like it. I think people relate to him so well because he's got that public-private dynamic that struggle that goes on with him. All of us have a, a public face and a private face. We all have a, a private persona that we think, you know, is the world doesn't see. And so I think people relate to the character well that way. Batman, I think, much more than a character like Superman, is sort of a wish fulfillment because you've got anonymity thanks to your costume and, you know, cool car and gadgets. I think kids want to do that. You know, they start off loving masked heroes and wouldn't it be fun if I could do that? And I think it's just an extension that we carry through adulthood. We're at the moment now where we're thinking, God, I hope we can do this. I mean, I know we can, but uh, now we have to. Rocksteady taking on that challenge. You know, it's it's half exciting and half terrifying. You know, the burden's out there that the world wants a great Batman game. And to be honest, we all want a great Batman game. So that's, you know, that's the inspiration as well for us, is that it just deserves, he's such a cultural icon, he deserves a game to match. A lot of people at work say, don't read the forums, but uh, I just get addicted to reading them. I read them and it says, 
Arkham Asylum, I can't wait to get it. A lot of people say, bought, sold, yeah, we're, we're going to buy this, and it really makes me excited. I can't, I can't wait for it to come out. We've got a lot of uh, critics that will be uh, kind of scrutinising this product. So we have to be careful in kind of what we show, have to be very focused. Uh, in terms of where we come up with the ideas. It's very exciting to see people thinking the game is looking great, but they haven't seen anything yet. And I can tell to the Batman fans that we've been really digging through all the graphic novels and stuff, and the game is full of cameos, of references from 70 years of Batman history. This game has its roots buried really deep in the history of Batman, and that affects all the characters. Well, the great thing about Arkham Asylum as a location is that all of the major villains in the Batman universe have been there at one moment or other in, over the last you know, 70 years. So it's very easy to justify why Poison Ivy's there, why Bane's there, why Joke is there. Not so tight, boys. You'll crease the soup. Gotham is a unique city, and it's populated by unique <laughs> supervillains and you just can't send these guys to a regular jail. You need a location that matches their twisted nature. So Arkham Asylum was created as this hospital for the criminally insane, and only the worst and the, the, the craziest of the criminals were sent there. When you play the game, you can follow the story, but the more you know about Batman, the more this game's gonna give to you. Most of the voices, for example, are considered the archetypal Batman voices. So we have Kevin Conroy as Batman, we have Mark Hamill as Joker, and when we recorded them, they just added a level that was unbelievable to the game. What they deliver is, because they've kind of done it before, they always have their own vision for it, which kind of lends itself very well to what we're doing coming from the comic and uh, graphic novel side. Uh, what took you so long? Hmm? <laughs> They're playing characters that you've heard them play before, but we're not that game. We're a darker game. Batman is a very special experience for me. It's a, he's just a very special character. What are you doing? Someone get over there. When choosing the game location, what we really wanted to do was to pick a location that could represent all the facets of Batman. Some of the books, some of the comics, they actually put Arkham Asylum on an island, and we thought that would be absolutely fantastic for our game as a whole. You can see Gotham in the horizon, I mean, the, the city skyline, but the entire part of the game is based in the Arkham Asylum. And Arkham Asylum as well is such a critical location in the history of the Batman universe. It's such a kind of central heartbeat where everything passes through. When you come out of maximum security and it's the first time you see the overworld and uh, Arkham Asylum is just there in front of you, this huge, beautiful building, it's really epic. We wanted some different places which represented all of the different parts of uh, Arkham. The Batcave was one of the more important environments for us to get right as an environment artist, and it's also one of the more important environments for Batman himself. That's where all his uh, weapons are, that's where he does his forensic, his comms, things like that. They created like a medical wing, so you go there, it's looking completely different. So if you're going from like Gothic to more kind of like Victorian. And then areas like the gardens, which kind of represent more the hope of Arkham. So you have this lovely balance throughout the environment. One of the things we really wanted to do with this story is as long as we've got Arkham Asylum as our, as our theater, so to speak, we were gonna cast it with his greatest villain. Kind of like an ultimate Batman fighting scenario. So you're gonna put him in a box, even if it's a relatively huge box, and fill it with threats he just can't escape from. His worst enemies of all time. The most violent, most unhinged, most nasty criminals he can fight. There's at least 30 or 40 characters that we've built for the game so far. When we started, we looked at who were the coolest villains that we really wanted to be in the game. Being at Arkham Asylum made it quite easy to put all of them in if we wanted. And then we looked at what would make the best gameplay, what would please the fans, started there and then just went for it. We really wanted to choose villains who would push Batman in completely different directions. So we wanted villains who would really challenge the kind of psychological abilities of Batman. That's such an important part of the character that get missed. The detective aspects of Batman, the physical aspects, obviously that's a massive element of Batman, his navigation skills. A lot of villains from the Batman universe are present. So you, you can see Joker, you can see... Poison Ivy, Bane, Killer Croc. We've got a brilliant design of Harley Quinn. One of the things that really scared me the most was when I saw the models for the Blackgate prisoners who were put into Arkham Asylum. These guys were so big and so massive and so brutal, 
I, I didn't even want to look at him. Also, we use a character called Victor Zaz in the game, who's the closest probably the real world has to a, a super criminal. There's an element of fantasy to everybody else. Yes, Croc is big and powerful and reptilian, but you're not really gonna see anybody like that in real life. Victor Zaz, you might see in real life, and you don't want to. The nature of the villains in the Batman universe are that they don't necessarily want to work with Joker. You know, they've all got their own agendas. You know, they're, most of them are lunatics or people who really just want to kill Batman. So, although Joker is in control, it doesn't always go his way. That gives the game a whole unique flavour, and Joker's such a fantastic character to base the whole game around and to really be driving the whole experience. Because he's so charismatic and funny, you kind of hate him, but you kind of love him, because when he's on screen, he's just so funny and interesting, but you really want to get him at the end of the day for making your life such a misery. Batman's surrounded constantly by Gordon and Oracle. Oracle provides his technical backup, plans, schematics if necessary for Arkham Island. She's kind of just off-site, being able to give him any information that he requires to solve the crimes. We've got two distinct kind of gameplay modes, and we want to achieve, with one of them, we really want to achieve a feeling that you're creating fear in the enemies, that you're really having an emotional impact on them, that they're reacting to the fact that they can't see you and you're Batman and you really are picking them off and, and kind of playing with them. The other kind of aspect that we work on for the AI is the combat side of things. Lots of people coming at you and you feeling like you're just batting them around, you know, you're, you're dancing around, you're jumping over them, you're really dealing with this huge multitude of people that are coming at you and that it doesn't feel like they're, they're holding back on you. In Batman Arkham Asylum, we tried to create a quite a complex, deep story where more's happening behind the scenes than you imagine. The story is probably one of Batman's biggest challenges. While delivering the Joker back to Arkham, Batman finds himself in the middle of essentially a prison riot, which has been orchestrated by the Joker to specifically happen when Batman is returning him to the asylum. The whole thing is a massive setup, and it's Batman alone against an army of criminals, psychotics, and supervillains. Begging to be slaughtered! Well, there's so many awesome areas in the game. One of these areas are the catacombs. It's a labyrinth of sort of dark tunnels, uh, cave areas where the croc lives. We've got a cross. It looks so good that you can almost taste the moisture. You can see it on your screen. It's that, that gritty, that dirty. You can go in the sewers. You can go in the cells. You've got the penitentiary uh, building as well. You go in the caves, and of course, you can just like uh, run everywhere you want because it's quite an open world. The whole game is persistent. There are no loading screens in the game at all. As you move around the game, you're in a completely persistent world and uh, that's really important to us because it's important this feels like a real place. Hidden throughout the island as well are hundreds of secrets that you can move around and explore and get rewarded with. So the more you explore, the more the game's going to give back to you. <laughs> There are a lot of objects that Batman has in the game, the bat claw and the grappling hook. Batman, again, a huge arsenal of gadgets to choose from. We really wanted gadgets that represented not only Batman's navigational skills, but also gadgets that allowed Batman to interact in new ways with the enemies in combat and also in Predator as he's moving around. A couple of examples of those gadgets would be the line launcher. So you have a gadget which you can fire, which fires like a horizontal zip line that Batman can fly along across anywhere in the game he can use this. And it's great for traversing gaps that you couldn't normally get across. But it's also great if you've got like three enemies in a row and you can fire it above their head and zip line down it and knock all those enemies out in one move. Some of the other gadgets that Batman's got include obviously his Batarang. It's really important that he has a limitless supply of Batarangs as he's moving around his Batman. So obviously he can pull out the Batarang and use that at any time. One of the other gadgets is the explosive gel. And you can get the explosive gel to blast through structurally weak walls. But even better than that, he can lay traps, so he'll put this explosive gel on the walls, the floors, the ceilings, wait until the uh, guys come along, and then he'll set it off, and all the shrapnel from the blowing up wall takes them out, and it's really satisfying to do stuff like that. It's great fun. The difference between animating for the cutscenes from in-game is really the cutscenes are kind of specifically for a scene. From the storyboards, we start straight away on trying to recreate comic book frames and compositions. And everything we do for the cutscenes is very specific to the shot. 
uh, we tend not to use, reuse too much and with having the, the studio right next to us it's very easy just to go in and kind of capture things that we want. Then we obviously process them, see if they work in the scene um, and continue to work on them until they're right. We actually worked on the cinematics for a good six months. I think that we became more focused as we, we moved on with the score. We kind of work in layers, so first you've got your, your basic visuals and then when the sound and the sound effects and all the music and everything comes into, into play, that's when it really starts to be something that you've, you've hoped for from the beginning. We had to produce not only, you know, it wasn't only double the amount of animation that we would have had in previous titles, it's probably ten times more, and the quality bar has really gone up now. There's a clear difference between in-game and cutscene animations. The cutscene team have to animate to the camera so they can accentuate key poses, silhouettes, and make it all work just for the camera angle. Whereas in-game, it's more about making it work as a whole so the player can see it from all different angles. So you need to make sure that you animate every single part of the body. With us, we don't have much time to do anticipation moves. If he needs to jump somewhere, it does need to be instantaneous. He can't have a long anticipation and then jump because it has to be quite responsive for the player. He needs to be able to press the button, it needs to happen straight away. So we've got quite a big challenge there. When we started the project, that we wanted quality to be you know, paramount. It had to be paramount because people love the characters. We wanted to do something that took from every great visual interpretation of Batman. So even though it doesn't look a lot like Bob Kane, you might see a little bit of uh, you know, a hint or a throwback to him. It isn't solely the Wildstorm look. There's a little bit of Neil Adams in there. There's a little bit of Frank Miller. We just wanted to get something that gave the coolest visual interpretation of Batman and his enemies. Also with Batman, in effect, he, he was two characters. The, the first character being Batman himself, his body, but also his cape for us was basically treated as another character. The cape is obviously a big signature part of Batman. In the comic books and the graphic novels, you, the cape is used to almost define a mood in a way, and it almost has its own character. We wanted our cape to do that, which was like a, a major time investment for us to get that to work. It's been quite a, a long slog for the cape. Um, it's quite a, a technical thing to get right. But we're really happy with how it worked out. Also with the cape, we wanted it to chart Batman's journey through the game. So when he had key encounters, we wanted him to, you know, like for example, if he was to have a fight with Croc, then Croc would damage his cape in some way, and that would constantly remind the person playing the game of their journey and what they've been through to get to the end of the game. If you're going to make DC characters, then they have to be—you have to give them, you know, weeks and weeks. So we'd probably spend anything up to six to eight weeks on a big, serious character. You'll work from the 2D image, but you'll actually end up with something that is different and hopefully gives more back. <laughs> Harlequin, who's kind of almost a young, athletic kind of character. We have to use uh, the motion to get this across. Our Joker is a little different. He's more dancing and more prancing around. You know, he'll hop around and make really exaggerated expressions and stuff. With the combat system in Batman, we really went back to basics and tried a lot of different things because we really wanted to get that feel of being a superhero. It's really important to us that when you pick up the pad, Batman, if he's taking four, five, six henchmen on, he doesn't have a lot of trouble. I mean, he's a highly trained martial artist, so we really wanted the player to feel that power. So the skill in the game really comes from when you're taking on eight, nine, ten enemies, one with a taser, one with a machine gun, one with a pipe he's ripped off the wall, and balancing that danger in the room. When we looked at how Batman would take down a number of armed enemies, we really kind of, I guess, the standard route to go would be to introduce a sort of stealth mechanic. But we thought that would make Batman feel really weak and scared of the enemies, and that's not what Batman is. He's a predator. He preys on these enemies, and he preys on the fear of these enemies. We looked at introducing what we called the invisible predator mechanic. Now, this mechanic allows Batman to move around in the rafters of a building without the enemies even knowing he's there. And he can study where they're moving and choose when and how to take them down. And that whole kind of preparedness of Batman is a really important part of his character as well. It's a mix of mo-capped uh, animation and more kind of like traditional hand animated uh, animations. Motion capture gives you a realistic experience. With hand animation, you can get more of, more of an emphasis on key poses, even in the sky. You still need to stylize the poses in the air, and that's where hand animation is always useful. The main villains are mainly hand animated because we want to capture that abstract feeling. People like Harley are, are acrobatic people, so we have to bring in a gymnast to do all the uh, gymnastic moves like walkovers, uh, flips, jumps, cartwheels, all sorts of things that nobody here can obviously do. Well, we find that animators are actually very good at producing the results they want to. No matter how good an animator you are, 
uh, it's that subtlety that really takes the time. And in games production, we don't have the luxury all the time of really spending a lot of time on the animation. So, you know, the, the ambient stuff we have in the background is looking absolutely fantastic now. This is our very own in-house motion capture studio. We're really lucky to have it. What we do is we're, after we've planned our moves, um, we get a guy into the suit and we cover him in these little shiny, shiny dots here. And we do a lot of calibration to, to make sure that uh, the, the software understands the size and shape of his body. And then we're pretty much, you know, after initial setup, ready to, uh, ready to start capturing. I mean, I think the, the main kind of areas in which the AI really challenges you in this game is in the predator rooms, where you're, you're having to kind of work out how to pick them off, and how to take them out without being seen, how to create that level of fear in them. And, you know, as the game progresses, obviously, the, the kind of challenge ramps up. This is the designer's main tool, this, this program, and this is how they put together levels how they, they slot together the building blocks of a level, basically. See whether the level's set up properly to allow the character to move around. And so that's more to do with the geometry of a level, how a, the physical kind of layout of a level, but this is to do with the events in a level, you know, how, what happens and what order things happen within that level. So this is what the designer would use in order to say, you know, create this character now, make him run over there, make him say this, make him attack that man. As far as working with uh, Nick, it's been a pleasure. Uh, the only interesting thing is as I deliver a piece at two in the morning, he's just arriving. So we get stuff back in the morning from Ron, you know, music for a cutscene or something, or a bit of in-game music. We can get it in, we can have a look at it, we can get the feedback to him and get another version by the next day. I'd love to tell you that it was painful, but it's been so easy. It's been a pleasure working with those two. Those guys really uh, are sharp, uh, know what they're doing, and. Um, it's been a lot of fun, more of a collaborative, coast-to-coast -coast kind of effort. Oh, there was an open line the entire time, you know, from the, from the get-go. So there was a lot of back and forth. We knew that we were going with Arkham Asylum as our location. There was a list of villains that looked to be like our key players. And then you kind of just, you know, made the whole thing fit. I am a Batman fan, yeah, yeah. I knew a few of the, of the graphic novels, but since working on Batman, I had to, like, sleep, live, eat, drink. 24 hours a day with Batman, so I kind of really kind of dig the character a lot since, and he's a really, really amazing, amazing. For me, as an actor, to be honest, the actor's job is always the same. It's to bring reality. An AI lead has to manage the, um, the focus of the AI, the, what we're concentrating on, what we want to achieve with the AI, so what, what effect do we want the AI to have on the player, um, how it reinforces what they do, how it gives them feedback, and how it makes them feel good about what they do as well. I would work on the sounds for Batman specifically, his movement sounds, creating his special weapons, things like that. One of the, one of the great things that uh, Rocksteady brings to it is it's a, it's a very English company, so there is a very English sensibility to the design and to the look of Arkham and to Gotham. Working with Paul Dini's been awesome. He's obviously he knows a lot about Batman. He's currently the writer on Detective Comics. Um, any questions we have or any ideas we have, we can run through him. It's just been a great process. I'm absolutely thrilled to have Kevin and Mark back reprising their roles in, in the Arkham Asylum game. There is no Batman in my mind other than Kevin Conroy, and Mark is the perfect Joker. It's so much more exciting if you can see him in the recording studio because he almost devours the microphone. He becomes so animated as the Joker that he, he kind of takes over the recording studio. It's really wonderful to be a part of. Because we had that much experience, we knew what we wanted to do uh, from the start. We knew exactly what we wanted to do with the shaders, we wanted to do with the environment, how to make it like work perfectly uh, on the 360 PS3. Of course, on the PC. We did keep the dark aspect of Batman because that essentially really grasps what Batman's identity is musically. But then past that, it wasn't, we really didn't care exactly what was written beforehand or not. It was just trying to blaze something that would be iconic to our game. And to that, I forgot to hand it to him and Rocksteady to take that chance, that artistic chance to be able to do that. I would say the entire game is looking very, very good. And I would say it's because I'm working with a very talented art team. They are very experienced. 
very senior and uh, it's very pleasure and a very uh, a joy to, to work with such multi-skilled guys. It's great to be a part of the Batman universe. The sound is going to play in the living room of millions of people. I mean, literally in the living room. It's going to appear in their living room. So it's got to make them feel that they are Batman. Sound-wise, I think, again, we're trying to put that reality on them and make them feel kind of a little bit of grit to them, almost a little dirty, <laughs> because that's kind of real. It had its own personality, and, you know, I kind of like that because it wasn't trying to copy anything or uh, be a movie. It was actually trying to make a good game, and it was more story and character-driven. Probably for about two-thirds of the game, you're not entirely sure where you're headed with this, and so it's got to make the player feel uneasy. Even like the simpler sounds, like Ray, those kind of relatively mundane sounds are the ones, like a light buzzing, they're the ones that can really freak people out the most. Same thing with the weapons too. The weapons that we did, they be very realistic sounding versus you know high tech, but it still could exist today. So we've got a week's worth of Foley books with Warner Brothers just to record things like people jumping, people landing. They're the most important sounds for me. Everything that Batman does, everything he reacts to, has got to sound not just believable, but it's got to sound like you are Batman. It's got to put you in the shoes of Batman. You know you want to. Since this is a case where everything's made up, it's not like you went out and recorded Batman out in the field. We have to add all that stuff and, and uh, blend it so that it actually feels real. What do you hear? What kind of would capture the emotion? So computers kind of allow us to create a, I don't know, kind of an audio junk sculpture, so to speak. There can be a little bit of a disconnect if the sound isn't correct with feeling like that character is actually real, a real actual person. And so getting all those little details, the foley and the, the sound design that is associated with each of those characters, right, really adds to them being real. What we're trying to do is to create the best video game score for a Batman game. The initial idea actually was not to write anything that was very similar to um, Hans Zimmer, Danny Elfman, or James Newton Howard. So of course that left a big wide open space for us uh, to discuss what exactly we're going to do. I'm quite interested in lots of music, kind of contemporary uh, classical music. And there's lots of, you know, obviously it's set in an asylum. There's lots of textures that we can lift from that kind of music that really suits the atmosphere of an asylum. Composers like Pendereski and Silvestrov and Cancelli, they, they, they kind of create really extreme orchestral textures in a completely different context. Kind of like horror music in a way. It's contemporary classical concert music. Nick had written a theme for Batman itself. There's one theme for the game, which is on that wall there. Often, you get, especially from publishers, you get this idea that, uh, okay, so there's Batman, so he'll have a theme. There's the Joker, he'll have a theme. And then at some point, they'll have a fight, and so there'll be a Batman and Joker musical fight. I'm much more interested in the player experience. So we've got a theme, like a bit of musical DNA, really, that is in every single piece of music. Is our theme. Get up! Now! It's our theme as well. We tried to get it into everything. That's the plan. There's no escape, Joe. I will find you. Every instrumental hue is like, if it was a colour, it would be like reflective of the colours we've chosen there. Like dark blues dark browns, you know, this is, it's a dark score, not just the melodic and harmonic material, but the actual instrumentation. Extremely loud, fast, busy, atonal, lots of dissonance, and then right back to kind of more traditional, kind of straight ahead Hollywood film score. We've played with the voice a little, Joku gets a bit darker than the, than the animated series. Nasty and yet sweet in a weird way, bittersweet, but very nasty. Note to self, need stronger test subjects. The most important sounds of the game are the sounds of Batman. 
the way Batman moves through the environment. Anything Batman does, obviously, is key to the player. Batman sounds like Batman. No, you can't ask more than that. Another mutation. If Joker's making these monsters, he hasn't perfected the formula yet. I need to hurry. Well, in here, it's a few days of just me, and that's, you know, six to eight hours a day. In, an, in a half an hour show, it's a two hour booking session with eight actors. Just today, we were in here for hours doing only my lines. That's much more than you'd ever do in a, in a, in a half an hour animated show. Because uh, it's never only one character. So there's a lot more work involved in these, but it's worth it.